Next, the final installment of our special series, Stopping Superbugs, which this week focused on the potential dangers of antibiotic use in industrial scale farming. Last night, science correspondent Miles O'Brien paid a visit to a pig farm. Tonight, economics correspondent Paul Salmon picks up our reporting by checking on how things are done on a commercial chicken farm. It's part of our weekly economics feature, Making Sense. Why are you I'm letting the chickens know we're coming. A chicken house in Salisbury, Maryland. Holy smoke. How many chickens in here? So there's about 49,000. 49,000? But you can see there's plenty of space for them to move to open areas if they'd like to. Veterinarian Bruce Stewart Brown oversees poultry production for a brand some of you may have grown up with. Every Purdue chicken has one of these tags on it. Frank Perdue became famous as the tough man to make a tender chicken. You might wonder what drives a man like this. But an even tougher man raised him. Me? Back in the 1920s, Arthur Perdue founded not just a hugely successful business, but some would say an entire industry. And this is ground zero to the chicken industry and in fact to all of intensive agriculture. It all began here. Johns Hopkins University environmental scientist Ellen Silbergeld is author of Chickenizing Farms and Food, which chronicles the rise of factory farming. We need it to feed the world, she says, but not by feeding low doses of antibiotics to livestock, supposedly to promote growth or prevent disease before it happens. Between 70 and 80 percent of total antibiotic production is used in agriculture. And is the use in agriculture creating as much resistance in the bacteria as the use with humans? I think it's arguably creating more. When bacteria are exposed to low doses of antibiotics, bacteria are stressed but not killed. And the community sends out signals whereby they share resistance genes. Really? Yes, so actually low-dose antibiotics over a long period of time are much worse than high-dose. Much worse, says Silvergeld, in that they expose workers and consumers to rapidly evolving antibiotic-resistant microbes, perhaps in the very air we were breathing near this chicken house in Sussex like County, Delaware. We and others have done studies where we've trapped the outflow from these ventilation fans and we can find antibiotic resistant bacteria that are genetically identical to the bacteria inside the house as far away as essentially three football fields. And furthermore, there are flies and other things that come in and out of the house and they can move as far as three miles away. Flies and fans spreading microbes that under the right conditions can cause serious illness, even death. We are coming up against the end of the age of antibiotics, exhausting what many have called the crown jewels of medicine. And if I may say, it, we're throwing them like pearls before swine. And you mean that? Literally. As my colleague Miles O'Brien reported last night, antibiotics are routinely fed to pigs and cattle, which live a lot longer than chickens. A practice microbiologist Lance Price understands even if he doesn't condone it. Pigs spend their entire lives in these concentrated animal feeding operations, crowded, stressed, standing around on their own feces. They're just more likely to get sick. For chickens, it all started in the 1940s, with some pharmaceutical industry studies purporting to show that antibiotics promoted growth. These are studies that were all conducted within laboratories. They were not in the real world situation of a chicken house. They were for very short periods of time, two to seven weeks. How many in a study? 30 would be a big study. 30 chickens? Mm. Most of them were four or five. On this flimsy foundation, argues Silbergeld, was a match formed between Big Pharma and Big Farm. I think the industry used antibiotics because they just always did. Jim the Perdue is the third generation to run the family business. Frank. For decades, Purdue's poultry, like almost all chickens, were raised on antibiotics. There was a perception that they would grow better if you gave them antibiotics because it would, for lack of a better word, clean up the gut and absorb nutrients more efficiently. 
But the evidence really wasn't there. But you know, you do a lot of things that you've been doing it forever, and you just assume that's the way you do it until you actually look at it and test it. In 2002, Purdue Farms did just that, publishing the results of a three-year experiment involving millions of birds. Half were raised on antibiotics, the other half not. The data basically showed there was little or no difference. Silbergel then asked economists to calculate how much bang Purdue was getting for its antibiotics buck. The standard cost-benefit analysis at the heart of economics. A return on investment, yes. And the results showed that they were actually losing money by purchasing antibiotics. But their own study wasn't what turned Purdue against maintenance antibiotics, the latest Scion says. We did it because the consumer was asking for it. Fifteen years later, all chicken sold under the Purdue brand has been raised with no antibiotics ever. If you say no antibiotics that are important to humans, there's a but. Or no antibiotics uh, except subtherapeutic, that's a but. But it wasn't easy, nor was it, as they say in chicken, cheap. Step one, says Purdue's chief vet, Bruce Stewart Brown, was to ramp up their hatchery hygiene. If there's a piece of organic material, just wipe it off and use a different spot, and then turn it over, use another spot, and then get rid of it and get a new one. A new baby wipe, that is. They use a lot of baby wipes. We process four days a week. David Bailey is hatchery manager. For one week, I need 1,451,520 eggs. Step two, make sure the vaccine that goes into every egg is uncontaminated. Previously, a vaccine to prevent a chicken viral disease was mixed in the middle of the hatchery, with antibiotics added to kill common bacteria. So this is the vaccine mixing room, and we actually put laminar flow hoods, special airflow. That keeps the vaccine from getting any contamination, even in this controlled environment. Step three, a vegetarian diet to replace the antibiotic-laced feed. We got rid of meat and bone meal uh, because that introduced salmonella and other things into the diet. And now they're experimenting with lifestyle changes, including increased playtime in a handful of hen houses on the theory that it takes a happier home to grow a healthier chicken. Play is a little bit down right now. They're resting quite a bit. Can't we just go, hey, chickens, be active? Turns out, to my embarrassment, that this isn't how chickens like to get around. That's scaring them. OK, guys, sorry. I apologize. I, I thought I was playing. Purdue is succeeding antibiotic-free, but with all the concern and dire warnings, how is it that an estimated 70% of the industry is still raising birds on antibiotics? Some chicken brands use labels to trick people and charge higher prices. Raised without antibiotics? That's just marketing speak. Mississippi-based Sanderson is the nation's third largest chicken producer, just ahead of number four Purdue. They say most of their customers don't much care if they eat chicken raised on antibiotics. Across the southeast, where most of our brand branded product is sold, is simply not that big of an issue. And says Chief Financial Officer Mike so Cockrell, while it's nice to sell antibiotics raised chicken at a lower price, that's not why they use the drugs. They want to be fair to the fowl. If I can prevent illness in the flock, we're going to do that. We sat down with our vets and asked our vets to do their homework. Company President Lampkin Butts. And tell us whether any, uh, anything we're doing with antibiotics in our flocks causes antibiotic resistance in humans. And they did the research and they came back and said, absolutely not. So we asked Chief Veterinarian Phil Steyer, doesn't the use of antibacterial drugs in animals raise the possibility that there will be resistance in bacteria and other organisms that will come back to haunt human beings. Using antibiotics will induce resistance in any organism. The question is, what does so food animal medicine in particular milk. have to do to contribute to that? And I think that risk is so small, we can't measure it. The scientists we've talked to say there's a real danger in using mm -hmm. antibacterial drugs in animals like chickens. We've talked to scientists as well. Veterinarian Martha Ewing. But we have our own scientists that say that if we get a bacterial infection in chickens that's serious enough to warrant 
another antibacterial. And it's very possible it may actually induce more resistance. It sounded like the red state, blue state divide. The University of Minnesota, Kansas State University, they can't find the link in terms of human resistance based upon food animal use. While the elite East it, Coast schools have. Says so no we problem. asked Ellen Silbergeld of Johns Hopkins, is it your word against their word? No, it is not. And if I may say so, I'm very tired of the press who says on the one hand and on the other hand. But you do understand that somebody in my position who can't possibly assess one study from the next or one journal from the next, you can understand why I would be trying to be on the one hand, on the other hand. You know, at a certain point, this is rocket science. Okay, so what am I supposed to do if it is rocket science? Fortunately, I had someone else to turn to. You're the guy who covers rocket science. So am I just out of my depth here? I'm afraid it is rocket science. And the scientists I speak with are practically apocalyptic about a post-antibiotic era. Think of the procedures that could not happen. Chemotherapy, uh, cesarean sections, hip replacements, all of them absolutely rely on antibiotics. So imagine a world when we can't have those procedures and when people die of simple blisters, as occurred not uncommonly in the pre-antibiotic era. But we don't want to scare people. I mean, this isn't happening right now. Most antibiotics still work for most problems that people have. But the numbers are grim, and it, it is time to do something right now. The alarm bells are ringing. And from my point of view, the problem is that the market hasn't been able to solve this problem. Maybe it cannot solve this problem, and therefore we need alternative solutions. Uh, for the PBS NewsHour, this is economics correspondent Paul Salman. And I'm the science correspondent, Miles O'Brien. And you can watch all of Miles O'Brien and Paul Salmon's reports on antibiotics and superbugs online at pbs.org newshour.